I'm doing well? Yeah, great. Awesome. For those of you that don't know who these strangers are up on the stage, there, that's Kyle and Jamie DiGiacomo, um, you know, longtime members of this family. Uh, they live in Chicago now, but um, they were, Kyle was our worship leader for the first uh, many years of our church, and so just here visiting, just hanging out, right, doing a little Disney thing. So they thought they'd come and, and hang out with us. They'll be up in a little while again to uh, to worship with you again. So just thank you guys. I don't know what happened to Jamie. She disappeared. She ran away. But thank you. Appreciate that. I imagine, not with you, but I imagine that what we just did, that might, uh, might sound a little bit like that in heaven when we get there. That's going to be good. So, hey, do me a favor and open up your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, please. And while you're turning there, I want to see if you'll help me out a little bit this morning. Would anyone care to uh, tell me what your favorite movie is? Anyone? What's your favorite movie? Shack. Anyone? What is it? The Shack. The Shack. Okay. Hey. <coughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, that's cool. Um, anybody else? Hey, well, let me ask you this. Okay. No, this is a house of love, right? House of love? House of love? House of love? Yes. How many people didn't like The Shack? Raise your hand. How many people really like The Shack? Oh, yeah. Some people did, right? Who else has a favorite movie? Yell it out. Passion of Christ. The Passion of Christ, of course, is one in every group. <laughs> who, who really liked The Passion of the Christ? Right? Anyone like that? How many didn't like that? Any, anybody else have a anybody else have a favorite movie? Like you can say what is it? A Knight's Tale. A Knight's Tale. There we go. Okay. Anybody like that movie? Night's Tale? Do you know this one? Do you know it? Do you like it? Did you not like it? Right? And listen, you can say stupid movies. My favorite movie of all time is Caddyshack. So let's just crack the seal right here. How many people like Caddyshack? Amen, right? How many people did not like Caddyshack? <laughs> you have problems and we'll pray for you. What is your favorite movie? Do you have a favorite movie? You raise your hand. Yeah, sure. What's that? The Godfather? Okay. How many people like The Godfather? I like The Godfather. We shouldn't, right? But 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 it's a house of honesty too, right? How many people did not like The Godfather? Um, I did. A couple people didn't like it. Marty didn't like The Godfather. So the point of all this is to say that sometimes, you know, you we all watch the same thing and someone will love it and it just really speaks to them, right? And then the same movie, you don't like it. That does not make it good or bad? No, just that everything speaks to, to people differently, right? Everybody's a little bit different. We're all made in the image of God, but we're all different. We have different tastes and different likes, right? That's just the way it is. And so it is with God's word, right? So I want to share with you something that, that um, I, I've been a Christian now since, um, I don't know, I don't have my born on date. What was it, about Yesterday. 2003? <laughs> Something like that. Kim knows. 2003, I became a Christian. And when I became a Christian, um, I got a Bible, and I started to read pretty tenaciously. This is—I've uh, shown you guys some some of you this before, but this was my this was my Bible, and I read it till it fell apart, right? And so then when I I couldn't read this one anymore, um, I got another one, and I started reading this, and now I've had to duct tape it, and you can see through the cover. It's just being worn out, right? I read it a lot. I, I hope you read your Bible a lot, too. But when you read your Bible, right, sometimes you read, and, and, and I'll read a verse, and you'll read a verse, and, and it'll really speak to you, but it does, does nothing for me, right? You know what I'm talking about? I like Caddyshack, and, and you don't, or The Godfather, or whatever, right? We're, we're all, all different. I want to share with you this morning some of the verses that you may have read before, but these are the verses that really impacted Moses Robbins. Okay, can I share those with you? Yes. Okay. And I have provided this for you. Like I have a, I have I have these, okay? And I want to make sure they get to you before you leave. But these are the verses that really spoke to me and have driven who I am and what I do and how I live my life. It's not a short list. Psalm 42 says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O oh God. I might take a break as I'm reading these to just make a point. But when you read that, you have to ask yourself, could you write that? Could you write that? And so, so most of us can't write that. But it's in there for a reason. 
because that's the way you're supposed to be. That I long for you. Like nothing else in this world I long for you. Like if I don't get you, I'm going to die. That's what the deer said, right? Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only, only, say only. 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 only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done. Mark 12, 30. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. What's, I'm not the smartest guy, right? What's the word that's being stressed here? All, all of it, right? And, it, and what it means is all of who you are. Love him with every bit of who you are, right? That's what he's looking for. And, and anything less. We gotta have a right view of this stuff, and, then, and it's gonna dictate how we live and how we think, right? Amen. And that's what the scriptures are for to frame your brain. Yes, Amen. Acts 20, verse 24. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use this life for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. And that work is. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. If I don't do this, my life is worthless. You, you could, look, the big thing is the presidency, right? You could run for president and you could win. And you could be the best president that there ever was. But if your life isn't for, for spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, your life is worthless. Amen. You understand? Amen. Listen, I hope your amens turn into a transformed brain. Because I've been listening to amens for 15 years, and it's done nothing. And I'm coming at you this morning, and you're going to know why. I'm coming at you, and I'm challenging you to don't amen these verses. You let them sink into your brain, and you make them transform the way you think and live. That's what the Bible's for. It's not a good read. It's to shape your brain, okay? To brainwash you. Yes. Amen. Right? To brainwash you. I'll come out and say it. Drink the Kool-Aid. Awesome. Whatever, right? Amen. He said, let God, Paul said, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's drinking the Kool-Aid, man. So let's not hide it anymore. It's what it is. Drink the Kool-Aid. Not my Kool-Aid. Drink his. Okay? My life is worth nothing unless I do this. Luke 14, 26. This is hard. If you want to be my disciple, you must. Can you say must? Must. So how much wiggle room is in that? Show me. None. If you want to be my disciple, Jesus Christ is about to tell you something. If you want to be my disciple, this has to get done. Or guess what? You go to church every day of the week. You're not his. You're not getting into the kingdom ever. This is it. Are you ready? Yeah. This is hard. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. That means your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. It's quiet, right? Yeah. You love your kids, don't you? Yeah. I love my kids. I love my wife. But compared to how much I am to love Jesus, and it's a command. Like, how do you conjure up love? I don't know, but you better figure it out. Because he said, you better love me. You have to hate Meredith compared to what you think about me and the way you feel about me. That's a high, high mark, but you've got to get there. You know why? Because if you don't, you're not my disciple. Ouch. Philippians 3.8. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded 
everything. Say everything. everything. I have discarded everything, counting it all as, my Bible says garbage. What's yours say? Dumb. Dumb. Duty. Crap. Everything else in your life that you could accumulate in this world, your, 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 even your giftings from God, your, your, your house, your family, your, your health, your wealth, your cars, your position, whatever influence you might have, it's all crap. That's what it says, right? It's all crap compared to him. And he says this, I count it all as crap so that I can gain Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, when I read that, I see in that verse that there's a requirement that if I'm going to gain him, I've got to get rid of everything else. I can't part time and be on the fence and play the field, right? At like, like we watched this morning, like some whore. Whoring myself with other lovers and just cheating on my Savior and giving some of my affection and some of myself to other lovers. Right? You can serve how many masters? Wow. One. That's what he's saying. If you want to be mine, if you want to gain Christ, everything else has to go. That's what he's saying, right? There's no denying the words of Christ. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, O Israel, euphemistic for his people, right? What does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God by walking in all, say it, all. all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. I don't know about you, but I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but do you see what's being said here? These verses gripped and kicked the crap out of my life. Like, they, this is why someone goes insane for Jesus. When you read this, he's not calling you to some part-time effort here. He's saying all or nothing. And that's why Jesus said that many, many will go down the highway to hell, but only very few will find my road. And there's two and a half billion people in this world that say, I'm a Christian. Not about you, but two and a half billion does not equate very few to me. When Jesus says very few, how do you make that equal two and a half billion? Because most of the people that say that they are, they're not. You haven't given up everything. You don't hate everything else compared to him. You don't love him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Your life doesn't show it. Your mouth doesn't show it. Your wallet doesn't show it. Your time schedule doesn't show it. And you know it. And I know it. This is just for as much for me as it is for you. And I'm glad God brought me back to these verses again to get me afresh, to fall in love with him again. I need it. And you need it. We all need it. Here's some more. Psalm 119, verses 4 through 6. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Turn me down a second. Just a little bit. Oh, you're the longing. Listen to the longing in this man's voice. Oh, that my ways were committed to keeping your statutes. You see, he can, he can recognize the, the failure in his life. And he can see the, the perfect decrees of the Lord. And he can see the section, the, this little cross section right here between the two. Like, there's a problem here, man. And he's like, oh, that I would. And it breaks his heart that he's failing God. Is that you? Then I would not be ashamed when I consider all your commandments. Psalm 119.30 I have chosen to be faithful. I have determined to live by your regulations. Is that you? Jeremiah 29.13 If you look for me wholeheartedly you will find me. You look pretty smart. What happens if you don't look for him with your whole heart? You don't find him. You, don't find him. you, don't find him. you can think that you have. You can worship this fake God that Kyle spoke of, that we make up in our own mind of who Jesus is, who Yahweh is. But the only time you're going to find the real Jesus, the one that really saves, 
is if you go after him with your whole heart. Are you doing that? Have you done that? Isaiah 50, verse 7. Therefore. It's like, you know what the word therefore means? Like, considering all that we've already said. Right? Considering all that you just heard. Therefore, I have set my face like stone, determined to do his will. Did you ever see a mountain? I'm thinking right now of when I was growing up. In my hometown, there's this little thing called Blue Hill. I brought pictures of it sometimes <clears> to the church. Here, but I used to drive, and there it was every year, every year, every year, every year. The antenna on top, the observation tower on top. Every year, every year, every year. We went back there just a, a couple months ago. Guess what? It was still there. And the face of that hill, there's this big boulder. I used to climb that up the face of it and go up the rocks, and, and people would paint on there, you know, their little graffiti and stuff. Guess what? The rock's still there, right? Still, season after season, rain, snow, sleet, hail, sun, night, dark, light, rain, year after year, decade after decade, still there. Therefore, considering all that I have told you, I have set my face like stone, determined to do your will. I will never relent. That's what it says. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Luke 9, verse 57 through 62. It's brutal. But it's what we're supposed to do. I beg you, please, let this shape who you are. This is Jesus talking. The guy you say you trust. When you think it's God, right? This is what he says. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And But Jesus said, well, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But I, the son of man, have no place even to lay his head. What's he mean? Are you ready to live that life? Are you ready to have nothing for my sake? Like, because I'm going places. I'm doing things. And it might mean you get nothing. Are you ready for that? And then he said to another person, because that wasn't enough. Come follow me, Jesus said. And the man said, yeah, I agree, I'll do it. But Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. Now that makes sense, right? You're supposed to honor your mother and father. The guy dies, you're going to give him a proper burial, right? right? Who would say there's anything wrong with that? Would you say there's anything wrong with that? It's the right thing to do, isn't it? What's wrong with this Jesus fellow? Anyway, he says, but Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. I said this a year ago, and, and the whole church admitted that they didn't like it, and I say it again. If you signed up for children's church this week because you're supposed to teach these kids about the kingdom of heaven and you let Meredith know a day or two before the weekend was over that you couldn't because your mom or your dad died and you need to do the funeral. And she said, it doesn't matter. Let somebody else bury your mom. Your duty is to get here and teach these kids about the kingdom of God. How many people would come back to that church? No one. Jesus said it. Do you understand the difference between what you think and the way you live versus what the Bible says? Do you, are you feeling it right now? I hope you are. That's the reason why churches are dead and empty. Because you don't get it, and I don't either. He's called us to something way different than you're experiencing and the way you're living. And you can sit here and, and twiddle your thumbs and go in your phone and say, I don't care about that, it's too harsh. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. right. You can enjoy eternity somewhere else, but I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. And I don't want under my watch for you guys to go there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm telling you the truth. I'm just telling you what God's word says, right? Right. Okay, that wasn't enough. <laughs> Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty. How, how many people like that? Listen, Nick, your duty is to go preach the kingdom. You like being told what to do? I know you. You don't. <laughs> but your duty, son, go preach the kingdom. That's what Jesus says, right? Your duty. It's not, oh, would you just, would you just come and please volunteer at our church? We need a greeter. No. 
Your duty is to go preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Right? No, no more of this half-hearted, I said it before, so crap, where you get to pick and choose what you want to do like you're some almighty one. He said your duty is to drop everything else and go preach the kingdom of God. That's what he said to do. You want to be his disciple, don't you? Get right. He says your duty is to go preach about the kingdom of God. And then another one, these guys are gluttons for punishment. Another one says, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. And you what? I'm leaving. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm packing my stuff and I'm out of here. Wouldn't that be acceptable? Yeah. Sure, right? That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says this, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Like, if you say, yeah, I'm in, I want to do it, but, wrong. Yeah, but, yeah, there's no such thing as yeah, but in heaven. There's no such thing as yeah, but here, unless Jesus is saying, you say this, but I say that. There's no room for you to give him yeah, buts, right? You want to be his disciple, right? He wants to advance the kingdom to the ends of the earth. This is what needs to get done. All in. All in. Let me give you one more. I, in the list, I could do this all morning. <laughs> Joshua 1, 7 through 8. Be strong and very courageous. That's hard, right? Because look at all the stuff he's telling you to do. That's, is that easy? Any of that easy so far? No. Give everything that you are to me. That ain't easy, right? Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left, then, like if you don't deviate and you obey all the, everything that it says, if you do all of this, right? I want to ask you this before I read on. How many people think their life is going as good as it could possibly go? It couldn't get any better. God, I hope not. There's a bunch of losers up in here, right? What's wrong with you people, right? Someone should be doing well. Not. Okay, listen, 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 listen. Do not deviate from them. Obey all the instructions. Then. You will be successful in everything you do. Secret sauce, right there, right? And how many of you are missing that? All of us, yeah. every one of us. We, we, we know the, the Bible says that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord, right? The call to his purpose, you, like you know it, you put it on your car, your t-shirt, your bumper sticker, your coffee cup, but you won't do it. Yeah, you'll do, right? Everything will work out if, 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 do what he says to do. Do what it says to do, right? Do what it says to do. He says, study this. He goes on. He says, study, study this book of instruction continually. You don't have to raise your hand and tell me if you're a, a continuous, consistent, every day, all the time Bible reader. Because I know you're not. I'm not. Not like I should be. If this is the words of life, you know, they're like, Jesus like, you're going to leave me. He's like, where would we go? You have the words of life. Like, we all understand that Jesus has the words of life. That's all right here for you. But, but yet you don't read it, right? I mean, we know it. Everyone knows this. How many people have ever regretted reading their Bible? Raise your hand. Right? But you like it, right? You know it's there, but yet you don't do it. You know, you don't do it, right? He says, uh, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. So maybe you read it and know what's right, but the reason you're not doing it is because you're not meditating on it after you read it. Right? You read what it says, you know what to do, but you're not doing it. Why do I keep doing that? What's wrong with you, Moses? Why do we keep going back? Because you're not meditating on it day and night. You read it, you know it, but you're not thinking about it. You're thinking about everything else that means what? Nothing. My life is worthless without this. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it only then. Only then. So if you're struggling, you didn't raise your hand a little while ago, here's why. Because you're not doing what it says, and it says only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. You can try any, listen, uh, Carnegie and, and all these other, what, I don't know, uh, Zig Ziglar and Anthony Robbins and every preacher in the world on top of them, you can try following everything they said. If you won't do what God's word says, you will not prosper in everything you do. That's why we're hurting so bad. Because we ignore the truth and what to really do. That's why. Secret right there. 
<clears throat> this is the verse that crushed me. It's written right here on the floor. Colossians 1.16. You get this, you get everything else. You get Everything else comes out of this. Everything was created by him. You all know that, right? Yes. And for him. We sang a little bit ago, it's your breath in my lungs. You dang right it is. And it's, it's in those lungs, not so you can breathe and go make money and be happy. It's so you can worship him. So that you can sing to him. So you can tell people about him. That's why you have everything in this world, including you, was created for him. Like you, This stuff right here starts reshaping the way you think. He wants everything. The only reason why I'm even standing here is because of him. Right? That's the reason I'm existing. And so, dear brothers, Romans 12, 1, I plead with you because of all this. I plead with you to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That that would be your reasonable worship. Like, because of this, everything I just read to you, because of all this, all your mind, all your strength, all your, your heart, all your soul, serve them with everything, all in, all in, all in, gospel forever. That's my whole life's purpose. And, and listen, because of that, I want you to give yourself completely to me. That that's your reasonable worship. And if you're not giving him that kind of life that's outlined in these verses, then that's not worship. That's some fake, phony crap. You can keep it at home. Don't bring it into the church. The church doesn't need your cancer. Right? Jesus wants your worship. Not the way you want to give it, the way he says to give it. And anything else is not worship. You understand me? God is the most important... I struggle with what to say here. I'm lame. He's the most important thing in your life. There is nothing more important than him. right? And this should shape the way you think. And the way you speak, it framed me. It changed me. Right? It's, it, it's not, it's, someone give these out. Someone give these out. Would you give these out? Uh, here, give these out. I want you to take these. Listen, the, I want you to, do me a favor, please. Would you commit to me right now, in the presence of God, that you will do your absolute very best to read through that list that I just read to you every day for the next week? And prior to reading it, would you say to the Lord, frame my brain. Frame my brain. Once and for all, frame my brain. And let the truth of God's word change who you are, change how you think, change your perspective, change everything about you, and be who he's created you and saved you to be. Finally, would you do that? Amen. More than two people? Yes. I want an answer out of a group of people that love the Lord God with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. Will you do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're looking for, finally. Twelve years. We want enthusiasm all in for Jesus. Yeah. That's what he's looking for. That church will change the world. Yeah. That's what he wants. Okay? These things need to, to, to train and frame your brain. This is the thing that gets you going when you realize that God doesn't want your part-time, show up when you want to, give whatever you feel like, serve whenever you can if it's convenient. No, he wants, you, he wants to ring you out of all that he's given you. Ring you out, right? Then go back, and then you rest, and then you get patched up, and then he puts you back into the war to fight afresh. That's what he wants. Leave it on the court. Isn't that what your coach told you? Leave it on the court. That's what he wants, right? And it didn't end there, right? So that, that's just like you'd have gone on forever and ever and ever, right? But the, the, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word never changes, right? So those things, like, they shape my life. I'm happy to go back and read them again, and it gets me fired up for him again, and I hope it does the same to you. But it never stops. He's relentlessly after you in this way. This is nothing new. Did you notice that I was reading you stuff from Deuteronomy? It's a long time ago, y'all. I'm reading you stuff from Joshua. I'm reading you stuff from the New Testament. It's never ending. The book is 
filled with this stuff. I don't know if it ever inspired you like it, it wrecked my life, right? And I want it to wreck your life. That's what I want. I want these verses to ruin you. Amen. Ruin you. And it never stops. So, so here, so, so in the morning, my wife and I, we get up and, and we spend a little bit before the kids jump into bed and, and, and ruin our day. <laughs> we try to read the Bible, right? So we were reading through First and Second Peter. Now we're back going into Judges, right? Guess what? These verses were, 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 were 15 years ago when I first read this stuff and, and I'm tearing through my Bible and it's wrecking my everything and changing my life and changing the way I think, changing my vocabulary, changing my priorities, my perspective, values, standards, everything. But here we are in 2020, right? Same thing. Same thing. He won't stop, right? So we're reading in uh, First Peter. Here's First Peter 1.14. So you must, there it is again, you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back to old ways, but be holy in everything. Say everything. Everything. Say it like you mean it. Everything. Be holy in everything as God is holy. Like Not like kind of holy or a little bit more holier than you were before or I'm just a little bit more holy than Kyle. That'll be good. He's a worship leader. As long as I'm a little more high, holier than him, right? No. Be holy as God is holy. He is perfect. He is different. He is above, right? He is totally different than anything else. He is completely righteous, completely pure in every moment since before time existed and long after it. He is perfect and he wants you to be like that. Is that you? Second Corinthians 5.17 says, but if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Amen. The old has died. Amen. Behold, that means you could see it, right? Behold the new man. Amen. That means to be holy as he is holy. Like who you used to be doesn't get to creep into what you are now. Amen. Whatever that old crap you were pulling before you bent the knee to Jesus, that needs to go. Right? You can't be that way anymore. You're a new creation. The old person is dead. Like, do, 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 does, does anything happen inside of your mind that makes you think, like, this is actually true? Or are you just coming to church? Because for 15 years now, I feel like people are coming to church. But this isn't really what they think. It's a bunch of rhetoric. It's not reality. If anyone's in Christ, you're a new creation, right? The old is dead, right? So he's part, he's part of that, but you're part of that too, right? Did he tell you what shirt to wear this morning? Did you pick it up? Picked it up. You picked it up because you've got some choices to make. The choice is this. If you're a Christian, quit the old crap, be different. And here's the thing. Don't just swear a little less, smoke a little less, drink a little less. That stuff needs to go. But I'm talking about everything. I'm all in, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, right? Everything I am, I serve him with everything I am, and my life is worth nothing unless I preach the gospel. That's what we're talking about. That's the new creation. Radical, insane for Jesus. He's everything that you need and everything you want, and all you care about is Jesus. That's what he's looking for. Now, churches that are like that, they wreck the world. People like that wreck the world. I'm one little nothing. And 15 years ago, he said, tell people about me, use the book. And all these verses that you see on that paper, they ruined me. And because I let them ruin me, and I don't take the credit for this, because it's been God won me and us. But probably 300 other people have given their life to Christ through this church and been under the waters of baptism through this church. Through, through him and me and us and willing to let these verses wreck me, I got to share the gospel on TV with 250 million people. That's crazy, right? Because I let this stuff be real. 
And if, and if God would let one loser like me do it, what would he do with the rest of you losers? Right? Right? How about if you get to talk to 250 million people, and then you do, and then you get to, and then you get to, and before you know it, it wrecks the world, right? Because people are all in for Jesus. Not just part time. Don't go to church, y'all. All in for Jesus. You know, if you have to beg someone to come to church, they need to get all in for Jesus. They don't need to come to church. They need to read that piece of paper that you got in your hand right now. Because if those piece, that piece of paper, if those things frame your brain, you, you're standing out there at 7 o'clock in the morning on Sunday going, where the heck is Moses and why has he unlocked this place yet? Right? You need a change. Holy as he is holy, not just holier or better. No, like God. Like God, right? Romans 8, 29 says God knew his people and he chose them to become like his son. Con right? Conformed into the image of Christ. So when he, so he gives us a, he, he doesn't say just be like this ethereal being in, in space somewhere, right? He gives us a person of, of Jesus so we could see this ethereal being from heaven and go, okay, I want you to be like me. Be holy as I am holy, but you can't really see me. So I'll come down, I'll put on skin, and I'll live. And so you'll be like that. If you're like that, you'll be like me. Because if you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. Amen. Yeah. Right? He wants you to be like Jesus. How many weekends a month did Jesus blow off going to church? How many days a week did he blow off prayer? How many days of the week did he blow off helping people, teaching people, healing people, providing for people, loving people, praying for people? How many times did he do it? Never. Never. And you're supposed to be just like him. Don't be like me. Don't be like him. Don't be like him or him. Be like him. That's who you're supposed to be like. So every single day when you wake up, you should be thinking about this. I'm supposed to be like Jesus. What should I do today? Well, I would think you probably want to do a little praying. And I'm thinking maybe when we have our prayer night here, you wouldn't blow it up. Maybe, just maybe, you put those other things that are, what this Bible says, are crap, dung. Put those aside and maybe come pray. Laying it out there for you guys. Because asking you to come doesn't help. We did that last week. How many people want to come on Monday night that never come before? Three people raised their hand and you guys clapped. Guess how many of the three showed up? None. 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 Come on, go to Wednesday. How many, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Other people said they were going to come on Wednesday. He came. One guy came. Awesome. <laughs> how many weeks and years have we been asking people to help out with kids? You don't come. You got other things to do. I don't like kids. I watch kids all day. Someone else can babysit my kids so I can go to church. Pathetic. Can we be a truth church? Yeah. Am I hurting your feelings? No. No. Oh well. After the day's right. over, I don't care. Right. <laughs> Conform to the image of Christ. Holy. Pure. Righteous. And like Jesus, totally committed to the Father's ways. 100% never deviating from that. And that's what he's called you to do. And that's what he's called you to be. Sink in. To be like Jesus. Completely, completely committed in every second of your life to the Father's ways. That's your reasonable worship. Anything short of that, not reasonable. It says in some translations that's accepted worship. So what happens if you don't do that? I mean, we're, not, we're a pretty smart group, right? If that's accepted worship, anything less than that is what kind of worship? Where's that going to get you? Nowhere. Nowhere, Pat. Well, it'll get you somewhere. You know where you want to go. Jesus is our example, right? Even Jesus, I love Jesus because he's so human too. Because when we read the Bible and you read that list that I just gave you, how many people really like, like maybe right now because I'm yelling at you and you got the verse right there and you're in church and you're like, yeah, I want to live that way, I want to live that way. But at the end of the day, how many people really want to like totally scrap their life, do that, right? Not many. 
And Jesus was like that too. Is there any other way, Father? I mean, I'm here in this garden. I know I'm about to get whipped and beaten and, and stretched out and slapped and insulted and, and killed. And it's going to be bad, man. Isn't there any other way? I mean, we read this piece of paper and you might say that too. Isn't there like an exception clause to this? My mom prayed for me. Isn't that good enough? But your will be done. Yeah, he gets it. He gets it. And you're supposed to be like him. And Paul, same thing. He got it. That's why he says, follow me, right, as I follow Christ. Paul was totally into, my life's worth nothing. Worthless. Everything else is crap. My life is crap unless I use it with this in mind that I was created for him and I will use every breath, every, every bit of resource given to me to advance the kingdom of God and that's what I do. That's it, right? That's it. Follow me as I follow Christ. Over and over and over and over again in scripture. All of the, I mean, I could literally read, I could have given you a longer list, we could do this all day long. The Bible says you're, you gotta be all in, fully committed, absolutely sacrificing, willing to sacrifice all other things. I never stop. Unrelenting. This was Paul too. Go, 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 go. Gospel, gospel, gospel. No matter what. They plot against my life. I don't care. Kill me, but I'm going to use my last moment to tell someone about Jesus. You put me in jail for it, I'll convert the jail guard. That's what I'll do. I don't care if I die. I'm going to use my life for him, because that's why I'm alive. That's why he saved me. And that's why he saved you. Guy gets arrested, whipped, and beaten, right? Thrown in jail. There's riots in these cities. They have to throw him up on his shoulder on the shoulders of the soldiers to try to rush him out of town. And they arrested him. They're beating him, and the soldiers arrested him. Riots, they're trying to kill the guy, and he never ever stops. Why? Because my life is worth nothing unless I do this. Preparing, and I'm thinking to myself, man, these folks are going to be like, I'm just so sick of this. I have been listening to this raving Jew for 10 years preach the same stupid thing over and over and over, and I am so sick of this. Can you God, please friend. give me something new? It's a big book. What are you clapping about? You? <laughs> Thank you for that. Give me something new, right? Give me something else. Well, I don't know. I'm, I read my Bible a lot, and I, I think that God must realize that there's, you know, you buy a car, they have, like, standard features and then options. Yeah. The standard feature of every human on earth is stubbornness. Oh, yeah. You're stubborn, and so am I. I'm stubborn, you're stubborn. We're all stubborn. And I think that's why, from cover to cover, right? I was in Deuteronomy, and, and I'm all the way into the New Testament, and it's the same thing. We're stubborn. Children. First Peter, he calls us children. I mean, there's people in this room that are older than I am, right? Would you like it if I called you, hey, child? We're stubborn children. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, 80. You're a, you're a stubborn, disobedient child. Yeah. And so that's like, this is not me. This is just the truth of God's word. He's saying, listen, you're like kids. I need to remind you again, remind you again, over and over again, because you're stubborn. And if we would succeed in this, and we would get this, and we'd let it frame our brain, we could do as the scriptures would say, and that is to move on to greater and deeper things. But I can just tell you from a pastor's perspective, we haven't got this yet. Again, if we got this, you'd be standing in line waiting to unlock the door. Right? We wouldn't be wondering if we get to pay the rent this month. We wouldn't be wondering if, if maybe someone will come. We would be impacting our world with the gospel, right? If you got this. We all know God. 
and we all know his mission, and we understand that it's the single most important thing in all the universe, but, right, but, you know it to be true, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, And so that brings us right back to the Acts chapter 21, which I asked you to open to. Like, okay, we've been doing Acts for a year. Something fresh is coming around the corner, right? No. Why? Because you don't get it. Because you don't get it. Because you haven't given your, life, your, your, your mind, heart, soul, and strength completely to the worship and service of God. That's why. And he said, unless you do... You're not fit for my kingdom. So is this not, this is maybe a rebuke to you, but is it not love? Is it not the love of God being expressed to you? I, I died that you could go to the kingdom and be with me forever. And I'm telling you, you're doing stuff that's going to keep you from there. And I'm begging you, as if God was like literally begging you, get this. Please, church, get this. Acts chapter 21. You there? After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patera. There we boarded a ship sailing for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syria where we, the ship was unloaded with its cargo. We went ashore, found the local believers. We stayed with them a week. Just moving, 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 gospel, 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 city, city, island, island, gotta tell, urgent, don't know when Jesus is coming back, don't know when you're going to have your last breath, I gotta tell you, we don't need to be friends, we don't need to be going to coffee, but you need to know, and Paul understood that they needed to know, and so he didn't want anyone to die on his watch and go to hell when he could have told them, so he says, I never shied away from telling you what you needed to hear, and that was to repent of your sin, turn to God, and embrace Christ by faith, that was it, that was his message for Jew and Gentile alike. Island after island, city after city. I gotta do this thing, because otherwise my life is worth nothing. Is that you? So he goes there and he's with these people for a week, and these people it says these believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. I get it. God had given these people this vision, they, they, this this knowledge that. Paul was going to run into some problems when he goes to Jerusalem. See, Paul was trying to get to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost because God's word says to go do that. That's why we do it here, right? And so he knew that. So he's trying to get to Jerusalem, it said. And the believers there are like, oh, God has told us that you're going to, that you shouldn't go. Why? Well, we have found out earlier from Paul in the previous chapter, he said, I don't know what awaits me in these towns. But I do know this. The Holy Spirit told me in city after city that jail and suffering are coming my way. And so these people are just, they're just agreeing. They're confirming the message that, that God had given Paul. They're like, listen, you're going to have problems over there. It's going to be bad for you. How many people would feel as though, like, if, 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 if I knew that your car, the brakes on your car didn't work, and I saw you getting into your car, how many people would like for me to tell you? Would you like me to tell you? Because yeah. right? I love you, right? You, don't you love me? Wouldn't you tell me that my brakes are out? Wouldn't you tell me there's a sinkhole down there in the road and you know I'm going that way? Wouldn't you tell me? Of course they're telling them. Listen, there's problems coming your way. It's going to be bad for you. And, God's, and Paul's like, yeah, I get it. It's loving to tell him to stop. You don't want anything bad to happen to the dude. But let's read on. You have, I need a proper perspective on this. When we returned to the ship, at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. They, there we knelt, prayed, and said our farewells. Then we went aboard, and they returned home. Then this, I'm not going to read it all. Verse 7, they make another stop, leave Tyre, and go into this other place. They stay with Philip the Evangelist. Verse 10. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who had also had the gift of prophecy, so God had given them this this. Ability to like see things in the future. Like this is what's going to happen. It's pretty awesome, right? He, he gives him this ability to see what's going to happen. He says uh, he says that he, he also the gift of prophecy. He arrives from Judea and he comes over. And he takes Paul's belt off of him. He binds his own feet and his hands with it. And then he says, "The Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem 
and turned over to the Gentiles. So like, here's another person confirming the message that Paul already knew, that the believers in that other town had already confirmed, and here's this other guy saying, listen, it is not going to go well for you. I love you. Don't do this. Like, we would all say that. Trouble's coming your way. There's a, there's, there's, there's a cliff over there. Don't go there. Right? We would do that. It's understandable. And it says, when we heard this, we and the local believers, they begged Paul not to go into Jerusalem. Totally understandable, right? So again, if you knew there was trouble on my horizon, would you? I would hope that you'd warn me. I hope you love me enough to say, hey, Moses, listen. Listen, we all know, right? We're driving on the road. We see a cop car. So what do we do to the people coming? <laughs> right? Trouble, trouble, slow down, slow down. That, that's just what we do. We're nice folks, right? So these people are nice. They listen. It's going to go bad. You're going to get whipped and beaten and arrested. It's going to be bad, right? So they're doing what we all would do. That's their perspective. <laughs> this is funny. But he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. Got the wrong view of this man. You're, you're, I know that you love me, and you want me to be comfortable and safe and healthy. But that doesn't mean anything. It's like you're breaking my heart. Why is he break? Why is it? Why he didn't say I'm sad. He said you're breaking my heart. When does someone say that their that their heart's being broken? When someone's doing something that's making them upset and like, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. He's saying, no, no, the way you're thinking, loving, terrible. What's wrong with you people? You're breaking my heart. Why are you crying? He says, I'm, I'm ready to, 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 to. What's, I don't want to misquote this with the word of God. It's so important. You're breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Brains are broke. <laughs> See, we think everything's supposed to be so awesome and kind and fuzzy and warm, and I'll get to it when I can. And my your priority. And Paul's like, guys, you're so wrong. Jesus had these moments with his disciples. Have I been with you this long and still you don't know? Have you been coming to this church for this long and still you don't know? I've been like Paul, crying because you still don't get it. You still don't get it. We've been doing this for 12 years. You still don't get it. I'm ready to go to jail for Jesus and possibly die for him. Do you understand the priorities, how your priorities are whacked? This is what we're supposed to be. And so look what it says. It says, when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up. And said, the Lord's done. You will be done. Could this be said of you? Could it be said of you that no matter what came your way, you would not ever relent on advancing the kingdom? Could it be said of you that nothing could change your mind? No circumstance, no family member, no words, no nothing. I have set my face like stone, determined to do his will. And, and, and everyone would just say, he's just a Jesus freak and there's nothing we can do about it. Yes. That's what you're supposed to be. All in. Paul understood that Jesus and his assignment that Jesus had given him far outweighs his comfort. Americans, listen. His comfort, his freedom, his safety, his wealth, or his health. All of this other stuff means nothing, nothing, 
And I hope that I've been able to somehow be faithful to pass on to you the truth of what a real disciple is. And if you're not this, heaven help you. I today, like Paul, can say, if you pass into everlasting life and go to hell, it is not my doing. For I have been faithful for 12 years to tell you what you needed to hear. And I even printed it up and gave it to you to take home with you. I wonder if Paul did that. But I did. And now you have it. It's on you. I don't have a good segue. But I'm done preaching today. I want to ask you guys to take a few moments and bow your heads. And we're going to pray together. Stay engaged. Stay here. I find a, a fresh new courage and a fresh boldness in my spirit to stop playing church and just be honest and open and real in a greater way than I ever have before. And I'll tell you why here in a few minutes, but I want to say this. This is our offering. It's the time we give our offerings. Right? So I need some folks to come up and take these baskets up, please, whoever wants to do it. Mike's going to take care of it. He's a faithful soldier. So you see, I read you all this. Right? I read you all this. And so I'm saying to you, from being the pastor of this church for 12 years, that the existence, the life, the everyday flow of this church over 12 years is not reflected in these verses. And I can say, and I'm not out, you, you keep every penny you got. I don't care. I could care less. But I'm just telling you that when we gather here and we do our offering, the giving in this church is by no means reflective of anything we just talked about. The giving, I'm, I'm harsh. I told you it's coming at you today because we need honesty in church. The giving, the participation, the, the attending, the serving, the praying, none of it. It's awful, guys. It's awful. We'll have 100 people in here at some weekends, and there'll be a $400 offering. Do the math. Even if you're a tie, though, that's just... And it's, it's not just here, right? The truth is that 3% of professing Christ, Christians who go to church regularly, only 3% of them tithe. Everyone else just, they don't, they're not, they're not embracing what we just read, like, to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, to serve Him with everything you are, like, no one's doing that. And I just want to, I just want to tell you that, like, and I want you to take a few moments, and I'm going to shut up, and I want you to pray, and I want you to talk to God about you, just you, personally. Are you living the way you're supposed to live as a true disciple of Christ? All in with, for Jesus and his mission. Because it's reflected in the way you live. Right? It's reflected in the way you live. So pray, like talk to him. Like, what does it mean for me to be generous? What does it mean to mean for me to be thankful? What does it mean for me to like partner with you to, to, to go, you know, to the ends of the earth with the gospel? And, and then these guys are going to come through the room. And, and, and I want you to give out of that. Like, not out of, out of obligation or pressure or shame or any stupid motivator like that. Like, like everything was created by him and for him. So, like, your, your, your breath, your life, your hands, your feet, your back, your eyes, your, your wallet, your time, your prayers, your energy, your emotions, everything. It's for him. So I want your giving, let's break this curse that's on the church and let your giving reflect this truth once and for all and trust him. 
If you don't trust him, that's where you need to work. Don't worry about what you give. If you don't trust him, it's because his word hasn't changed you. His spirit hasn't, con hasn't, hasn't, hasn't saved you. His, his spirit hasn't changed you, right? The knowledge of God hasn't impacted you. That's where you need to go. So, so talk to him. And respond accordingly. Please, so help us, God. Respond accordingly.